Now, I am advised that when I was in, I think I might have been in New York or Tennessee at the time. I'm not at the moment. I said I was going to elaborate on John 10, 16 to 21. Is that correct, James? That has not been done. It's been omitted. So when we put this online, James will edit it in sequentially to where it should have been. But my apologies. I was jet lagged and I forgot where I left off. And anyway, we'll do it. We'll do it now before moving on to John chapter 11. Okay. Even if we have to begin chapter 11 next week, we got to do this now because I said I would do it and we don't want to leave it out. John 10, 16. Oh, I know how it happened. I know, I know exactly how it happened. The idea of the probaton and the um, uh, harpezo, the snatching away, and the probaton, and the uh, kleptos, and the patros. That, that, that fit what preceded this more than it fit in the, in the um, chronology of the verses. So we jumped ahead because the text and the subject of the text fit in previous verses earlier in the chapter and that's how i became um disoriented in my uh presentation and that was of course compounded by travel and jet lag uh that's that of course is not an excuse it's, it's just uh, an explanation my apologetic regrets for not getting it right let's begin in verse 16 i have other sheep which are not of this fold i must bring them also and they shall also hear my voice, and they shall become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one has taken it from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I receive from my Father. There arose a division again among the Jews, that is the Judean religious establishment and those they controlled, because of these words. And many of them were saying, he has a demon, he's insane. Why do you listen to him? But others were saying, these are not the sayings of one demon possessed. A demon cannot open the eyes of the blind, can he? And as we've been looking at, that was one of the messianic miracles that was the exclusive domain of the messiah to do it was only his brief nobody else could perform that kind of miracle of making a blind person see it was an identifying factor we've talked about this on the previous studies let's begin in verse 16. well absurdly the mormon cult has taken verse 16 and said that that was jesus coming to north american indians that the ten lost tribes of Israel and things like this <laughs> were North American Indians. And this was part of their whole interpretation of American geography. Um, <clears throat> that saw America as a new Israel or the second Israel. For instance, the Mormons arriving in Utah said that the Great Salt Lake was the equivalent, the, the, the biblical equivalent of the Dead Sea because they're both high saline. You can float in both of them. Um, you can't drown in them. Um, they would say things like that, and they would name places like Moab. Or they'd give biblical names to, to, to places. Now, others did that. Others assigned biblical names to places in the United States. Um, certainly, um, like Pennsylvania, you have a, a Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and there's a Nazareth, Pennsylvania, things like that. Mennonites tended to do that as well. Mennonites tended to do that, but they didn't do it by saying it had any covenantal significance to it. The Mennonites were persecuted terribly by Catholics and by Protestants. And uh, they were fantastic people, Dr. Lee. Menno Simons was well ahead of, of, of the mainstream reformers in his doctrine. He held to believers' baptism 
and things like this, but his people were terribly persecuted. Some of them fled east to Russia. Catherine the Great gave them refuge. Catherine the Great gave them refuge. She became the girlfriend of the co-founder of the U.S. Navy, John Paul Jones, who was actually born in Scotland. But <clears throat> she somehow made a deal that as long as they would not evangelize, at least in a high-profile way, the Russian Orthodox Church would leave them alone, uh, and the Russian government, as it was then, which were the czars, czarist Russia, would leave them alone. Even into the present time, you'll find Amish people or Mennonite people who will name their daughters Catherine in honor of Catherine the Great. Those were the Mennonites who fled east. Others came west to the United States. These came in the form of ordinary Mennonites, Anabaptists, and the Amish, the Pennsylvania Dutch, who are kind of a cult that don't have electricity or indoor plumbing or things like that. Um, anyway, they saw their coming to America as being delivered from bondage the way Israel was delivered from bondage from Egypt. And they just saw it that way and applied it that way, but they didn't actually believe that it was a basis of any doctrinal theology. Uh, that this was a place, you know, that was, you know, a promised land to us ethnically as a nation or a people. They did not believe that. Other nations have tried to do this. The Covenanters in Scotland made a covenant with blood and tried to sign a national covenant with God as a Christian nation. Well, if you've been to Scotland in recent decades, you see it didn't work. But other nations have tried that. But the Mormons went way beyond anything like that. They actually believed that it was scriptural. It was canonical. When they left Missouri, they first said these things about Missouri, and then they said it about Utah, where they finally wound up. And the whole Joseph Smith, Brigham Young thing transpired there. Well, one of the absurdities of Mormonism is to say that North American Indians are the lost tribes of ancient Israel. Now, they've said other stupid things. In the Journal of Discourses of Brigham Young, Volume 17, they said, um, Joseph Smith said, there's Quakers on the moon. <laughs> and Brigham Young said they're on the sun as well. An absolute lunacy. Well, anthropologists have always believed that North American indigenous peoples and South American indigenous peoples came from Siberia. It's not very far. It's only 50 miles from one of the Aleutian Islands in Alaska to a Russian island off the coast of Russian Siberia. Not very far at all. The Vikings or the Polynesians could have done that in their sleep. Okay, it was nothing. <clears throat> and this would mean that the North American Indians, who were red-skinned people, came from the descendants of Yafet, Yafet, the sons of Noah of Yafet, the same as Europeans and the same as Asians. Okay, so that's what anthropologists always believed. <clears throat> well, mitochondrial DNA in more recent decades has verified what they always believed, that uh, they have common genetic signatures with Siberian people, and they've compared Inuit Indians, and they've compared um, Eskimos with Siberian people. And remember, at one time, Alaska was Russia. It was part of Russia. There are still people in the Aleutian Islands who, whose religion is 
Russian Orthodoxy. The Russian Orthodox Church is still their religion, and it's the only place in America you will still find communities that can still speak Russian. Uh, Russian disappeared from Alaska by the turn of the 19th century to the 20th century. It was, it was pretty much gone, except for these outer islands. So it was a very close place for them to come. And it was geographically, it made sense. Anthropologically, it made sense. And also, now genetically, it's, it's, it's pretty well proven. Um, the Mormons have a problem. They're actually saying now that God changed the DNA of North American Indians in order to test the faith of Mormons. <laughs> now, that's only one of their problems. Their Book of Mormon names all kinds of crime, uh, coins in the Book of Naphtali. They name all these things, and nobody's ever found any evidence of it. One thing we do know from biblical archaeology is one of the things you continually find, if you go to any museum of biblical archaeology or ancient Near Eastern archaeology, is you find coins. You find coins with heads, they're minted, it tells you who the emperor or king was or under whose control something was. There's nothing like that, nothing, nothing at all like that, even though the coins are named in the Book of Mormon. Which, which is nonsense. Well, North American Indians are not ancient Hebrews. Yet, this is the kind of absurdity, absurdity, that Mormonism is based on. Absolute absurdity. <laughs> makes no geographical sense. Makes no scientific sense genetically. It makes no anthropological sense. It just doesn't. It just doesn't. They don't have those kinds of features. But let's <coughs> look at this. Who are these other sheep? To the time that Jesus was speaking to the apostles, they would have first of all thought it was diasporic Jews. Diasporic Jews. There was a large Jewish diaspora Shwara, spanning from Iran, that time called Phrygia, or what had been Persia, all the way, all the way to Rome, and even in some cases beyond that. You had Jewish communities in Alexandria, Jewish communities in Antioch, Jewish communities in Athens, Jewish communities in, in, in Thessalonica, Jewish communities in Rome. They were all over the place, okay? You see this in Acts chapter 2, okay? Um, people were coming from all these nations. That, so the people of the time would have applied this to diasporic Jews and to Gentile proselytes to Judaism. That's who they would have applied it to. And that would not be wrong. They were right what they thought, but they were not right in what they didn't understand. How do we know that they didn't understand? Well, we knew that they didn't understand. We know from Acts chapter 10, from Peter's encounter with Cornelius. How can Gentiles become believers in the Jewish God unless they undergo ritual conversion to Judaism? So they didn't understand it was about Gentile Christians or non-Jewish Christians. We, however, do. We go all the way back to Abraham. It was God's promise that through Abraham, he would not just be the father of Israel. God changed his name from Avram to Avraham so that he would be called the father of many nations, the father of many nations. I'll make you a great nation, that of Israel. I'll bless you, make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing, okay? And I'll bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This was the greater purpose of God. The salvation of Israel and the election of Israel were God's vehicles for the Jews to be lights to the nations. Now, Talmudic Judaism has uniformly failed in this mission. 
uniformly failed when it rejected its Messiah. The ones who did succeed were the early Christians who were Jewish, the early Messianic Jewish believers. They were the Jews who did fulfill this. The ministry of Paul and Barnabas to the Gentiles. Later, Peter would go to Rome. John would go to Ephesus and so on. That this idea of a light to the nations could only be, and still can only be, fulfilled by born-again Jews, by believing Jews. The calling has not gone away. The calling to be lights to nations is extended to the church through its mission, through its commission to be proclaimers of the gospels as missionaries and evangelists. It's extended to the church, but not to the exclusion of what God gave to the Jews. Israel is still to be a light to the nations. Now, this will ultimately reach its fulfillment, of course, in the millennial reign of Christ. In the millennial reign of Christ, um, people will be drawn to the God of Israel and the Jewish people. They'll grab the hem of one Jew and take us. You have the true God. In the millennium, this will be fulfilled. Okay? But right now, it is only capable of being fulfilled by Jewish believers and by the true church. The true church composed of Jew and Gentile. Okay? Judaism has failed to do this. Nonetheless, these sheep who were not of the present fold that were there. Yes, it was diasporic Jews, many of whom would believe. A polis being an outstanding case, but certainly not the only one. Okay, Timothy being an outstanding case, but certainly not the only one. Um, and so on, and so on. But Jesus was speaking of non-Jews. This began with the Gentile god fearers the people scattered throughout the Roman Empire, who saw through the futility and hopelessness of paganism and the idolatry and superstition that accompanied it, and turned to the Jews as having the one true God, particularly once the Septuagint, the Hebrew scriptures, were in the lingua franca, okay? There were a number of Gentile God fearers. They had not undergone conversion to Judaism, but they did change their thinking, spiritually, doctrinally, theologically, call it what you will, towards Hebrew monotheism, towards Hebrew monotheism. And of course, once the gospel came and the Holy Spirit was given, and as we see in Acts 15, these God fearers could have the same salvation and the same covenant promise of eternal life as believing Jews without under having without having to undergo circumcision, they flooded into the church. And eventually these Gentile God fearers outnumbered the natural branches, the Jews. Now that is just in verse 16. They did not understand what he was meaning yet. They did not begin to understand what he was meaning until Peter came to Jaffa, to the house of Simon the Tanner, and it was taken to Kassadia, the birthplace of the Gentile church, to up to uh, Cornelius and his family. In a study of the book of Acts, the importance of Kassadia Maritina, which was the actual Roman capital, cannot be overstated. It's where Paul was in prison for two years, and it's where he began his final journey. It was the birthplace of Gentile Christianity, of non-Jewish Christianity. In that sense, it was the birthplace of foreign mission, birthplace of foreign mission. Um, it happened there before it happened in Antioch, when the Holy Spirit had set out for me, Barnabas and Saul. It began in Peter's encounter with them, and then followed up by Philip uh, the Evangelist, also coming to Caesarea. This was before Antioch, uh, before the salvation of Paul, even. <clears throat> uh, very briefly, it was necessary that the first non-Jews came to faith through Peter, or through one of the twelve, and not through Paul. 
because there were those, and there still are those, who tried to say that Paul began Christianity, Peter followed the Christianity of Jesus, Paul began another religion. This is believed today and taught by certain academic rabbis, even orthodox rabbis, who've looked at the New Testament with a scholarly eye. And their basic way of thinking among many of them, probably most of them, is that Paul began Christianity. Jesus never came to make another religion. Well, that is true. Jesus never came to make another religion, but he came to fulfill the existing Judaism and extend the way of salvation to the Gentile nations. Jesus said salvation comes from the Jews. The Torah will go forth from Zion. That is all in verse 16. Verse 17. The Father loves me. I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it away from me. I lay it down. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up. The Father commanded this authority be given to his Son. Now, as God, Jesus had this authority of his own. But because of kenosis, identifying with us, well, he never laid down his deity, he never stopped being God. He did not draw on his divine power or authority. He only did it by the authority of the Father. We see this in Gethsemane. Father, let this cup pass from me. Jesus did not use his own authority to avoid the cross. He committed himself to the Father and said, your will be done. Okay, your will be done. Jesus had the option of exercising his own authority <clears throat> in Gethsemane and not going to the cross to pay for our sin. Likewise, in the temptation narrative, if you are the Son of God, do this, do this, do this, the devil said. Jesus could have actually done those things by his own authority, but did not. He only did what he saw his father doing, what his father told him to do. He didn't just go around healing people at random, as we've looked at. He healed the ones his father told him to. But let's look. I lay my life down. On the cross, Jesus said, if I asked my father, he would have sent three legions of angels to wipe out the Romans and the, everyone else. But he, again, committed himself to the Father's will. Well, let's understand this. Who killed Jesus? Who's responsible for his death? Well, in the broad sense, we are all responsible. He had to die for our sin. He didn't have to, but he chose to. It was us or him. So it became the just for the unjust. This precious truth, the gospel, penal substitution, propitiation, is denied by such heretics and false brethren as Steve Chalk in the United Kingdom or William B. Young, the author of The Shack in the United States. These are false brethren. These are not Christians by any biblical definition, by their own confession. If somebody denies the deity of Christ, or if somebody denies propitiation that he took our sin on the cross and was executed in our place, they are not a Christian by any biblical definition. Now, I understand that new believers or there may be people who love the Lord don't fully grasp this, and they need to have it explained to them. But if somebody denies it, we cannot consider them to be a brother or a sister in faith. And again, I refer to the, I'd call it a tragic comedy if it wasn't so disgusting, that so many naive and undiscerning believers read that book by William B. Young, The Shack, and said they were blessed by a book that was written by somebody who denied that Jesus died for our sin, by a false brother, by an agent of the devil. 
<coughs> but let's look. He died for all of us. In that sense, the entire human race, from Adam and Eve to all of us, are responsible for his death. But responsible for his death in the legal or penal sense, that is something else. There are three people responsible, or three persons, the scripture ascribes responsibility to the murder of Jesus. It was a pseudo-judicial procedure, I'll come to that in a moment, to the murder of Jesus. Three. The first is the devil. They knew God would raise him from the dead, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Satan wanted him dead. Satan wanted him dead. Sandy, we're in John chapter 10 again, verse 16 to 18. They wanted him dead. Satan wanted him dead. Okay. That's the first. The second is Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. Scripture blames Judas for the betrayal. The son of perdition. Again, the most important type of the Antichrist in the Bible and maybe it goes beyond type. The scriptures speak mysteriously of Judas when he kills himself as having gone to his own place. Uh, I have a book I wrote called Shadows of the Beast. I'm not here to promote it, but in some way, as John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. He was not Elijah, but he had the spirit of Elijah. The Antichrist will have the spirit of Judas at the very least. At the very least of the spirit of Judas. As there will be a physical return of Elijah, we cannot rule out the possibility that somehow, this idea that he went to his own place, somehow, the Antichrist will be a virtual clone of Judas. I don't say a biological clone necessarily, but I don't say not. I would not want to use the term a reincarnation of Judas. I would stop short of that. But there is a, as there is a reappearance of Elijah, there is a reappearance of Judas. Let's just leave it at that. The son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. That's Judas. He's the second. Now, I hope I'm not going to be misquoted or misunderstood for what I just said. I point you to the book. I don't believe in reincarnation as such. <laughs> But Elijah wouldn't be reincarnated. Uh, he never died. He wouldn't have to be. Um, Judas did die. So I, I wouldn't use this, the term, the same thing about Judas. He was dead. But there is something of the character and nature of Judas that is going to come back. Uh, we have teachings explaining it, and I will explain it a little further next week when we get to the betrayal of Jesus in John 11. <clears throat> bear it in mind. Now, the third person is God himself. Look with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 53. Yishayahu Hanabi, Yishayahu Perek Nun Gimel, Isaiah 53. Verse 4, surely our griefs he himself bore, our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. The father poured out the wrath for our sin on his own son. 
Beyond these three, Satan, Judas Iscariot, foreshadowing the Antichrist, and God, the only one we can, in any degree, ascribe culpability for the death of Jesus is Jesus himself, who, of course, was God. So there's still three. I lay my life down. No one takes it from me. The Sanhedrin could not have conspired to have him murdered. The Romans could not have executed him. He laid his life down, an atonement for sin. One of the great travesties of the history of the church is to blame Israel and the Jews for the death of Jesus. This is certainly not scriptural. Certainly not scriptural. Not at all scriptural. It's not what the New Testament teaches. We will look at some passages. It was not the understanding of the early church in either the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. I quote from the Kratos, the earliest creeds of the church, from the Kratos. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Okay. Crucified, died, and was buried under Pontius Pilate, Pontius Pilatus. That was the confession of the early Christians who got their doctrine directly from the apostles. Okay. Legally, he was executed by the Roman government. The Sanhedrin had no legal authority to carry out an execution per se at that particular time. Later on, we see it with Stephen. They tried to do it anyway. But Jesus was too high profile of a figure. The Roman government could not execute Jesus. They would have liked to kill Paul, but he was a Roman citizen. They couldn't. The Roman proconsul assigned 200 Roman legionnaires to escort Paul on the military escort from Jerusalem to Caesarea to protect his life. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish authorities, had no right to carry out Capital execution. No legal right. In the 1970s, there was a forensic judicial inquiry by a team of academic legal historians, and it was chaired by Hein Cohen. Hein Cohen was the Nasi of the Israeli Supreme Court, the president's presider like the Chief Justice of the Israeli Supreme Court. And I recall, I don't believe he's still alive, but I recall watching the interview and what he said. The conclusions of this academic investigation by scholars, Jewish, Christian, just an objective scholarly inquiry, from a legal perspective, into the trial and execution of Jesus. According to Chaim Cohen, the President of Chief Justice of Israel, President of the Israeli Supreme Court, these scholars concluded, firmly concluded, that the trial of Jesus and the subsequent execution of Jesus was completely illegal according to both Roman and Jewish law. The trial and execution of Jesus was illegal according to both Roman and Jewish law, said the Nasi of the uh, the Israeli Supreme Court. 
the chief justice in Israel. Well, it's quite a thing. Now, legally, the Romans did it. Jesus was accused of sedition. There was a reason the Sanhedrin accused him of sedition and said, we have no king but Caesar, even though they hated Caesar, they hated their Messiah more. This is only the religious establishment. It is because Jesus, Rabbi Yeshua Bani Yosef Minet said it, Jesus was only one, one of thousands, thousands of Jews who were executed for sedition by the Roman government. Now, the Roman government could sometimes be a Roman proconsul, a Roman governor appointed by the emperor, or it could be a Herodian king who were recognized as Romans by imperial Rome. Jesus was only one of thousands of Jews killed by the Romans. Now, I'd like to point you, please, to Peter's second apologia. Peter's second apologetic or apo apologetic defense of the gospel, okay? Turn with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 4. Okay. They arrest Peter. Persecution is brewing. They bring him like they did Jesus before the Jewish eldership in verse 5. And before the same high priest, Caiaphas, and John of Alexandria, all who were of high priestly descent. In other words, they were Levites, and they were Aaronic descendants of Aaron. These people would not have been Pharisees. They would have been Sadducees. Notice chapter 4, verse 1. The captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees. The Sadducees to this day are held as having been heretical by rabbinic Judaism. If you ask an Orthodox or an ultra-Orthodox or a Hasidic Jew today about the Sadducees, they would say that they were apostate or heretical Jews, and I even heard some say they were not Jews at all. The reason they are hated today, or they're as historical figures, not that they still exist, is the same reason the ultra-Orthodox hate the Karites, the Karim. It's because the Sadducees, like the Karites, rejected the oral law, the Torah Be'al Pei. Now, if you don't know, the Sadducees were descendants of righteous men in the aftermath of the Maccabees. We have prophecies about their forefathers in Ezekiel. They were the righteous priests when the rest of the priesthood went into reprobation and idolatry. They were the tzaddikim. A tzaddik is a righteous one. Tzaddikim. Tzaddikim. B'nei tzaddok, the sons of righteousness. They were the sons of righteousness. The tzaddikim. We know them, or at least they're those descended from them, as the Sadducees. Sadokim, Sadducim, same crew. Only in the Hasmonean period, particularly following the time of a king called John Hericanus, who was a high priest who unscripturally made himself a king, in the Hasmonean period, they became very corrupted. Among other things, 
they were willing to cooperate with the Roman authorities if it was in their theocratic and political and even financial interest to do so. Okay? To do so. Okay. It was not the Pharisees. Remember, the Pharisees were more divided. There were Pharisees who believed in Jesus, like Nicodemus. Particularly from the school of Hillel, not so much from the school of Shammai among the Pharisees, but from the school of Hillel, the book of Acts tells us many Pharisees believed in him, but they were afraid to publicly say so. Okay. They were afraid to publicly say so. Okay. Obviously, Rabbi Shaul of Tarsus, a Pharisee, a disciple of Rabbi Gamaliel, became a believer in Jesus. Gamaliel even said that if Jesus is not the Messiah, Christianity would disappear. At least it's Jewish version, it's original version. Whether Gamaliel became a believer or not, I do not know. Many say no, some suggest yes. I do not know if it can be proven one way or another. I, at least I can't prove one way or another. It is a possibility. I hope he was. But he certainly did what he did. He was considered to be such a righteous man. This is the tutor of St. Paul, who taught Paul to be a rabbi, that it says when he died, righteousness perished from the earth. He was a very righteous Jew in the eyes of everyone at that time. And at least an element or an example of that righteousness is found in Acts chapter 5. I'm sorry for the big deviation into Acts from John chapter 10, but it's necessary. Let's continue. When they heard Peter's apologia, and it's an incredible preaching by him and John, when they heard this, in verse 24, they lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O Lord, it is thou who didst make the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, thy servant, notice the strong identity with the Hebrew heritage and the Hebrew scriptures, the apostolic church had the original true church had did say and of course he's quoting from that incredible psalm too why did the gentiles rage and the peoples devise a futile thing this is of course sung in handel's messiah as one of the stanzas, the musical stanzas of Handel's Horatio, the Messiah. And it, of course, has overtones or undertones prophetically pointing to Antichrist. But here, Peter says, King David was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this. Why do the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise feudal things or a vain thing, as some translations translate it? The kings of the earth took their stand. And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. Now again, this does have a meaning, a future meaning. However, it's the first fulfillment was in the arrest, trial, and execution of Jesus. Notice, it's the rulers of the earth. For truly in this city, Jerusalem, they were gathered together against thy holy servant, Yeshua, Jesus, 
For thou didst anoint both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles. Herod, another major type of the Antichrist. He was an ethnic Idumean, an Arab. His parents' family were from Jordan, from Edom, who settled in Israel in the Hasmonean period. They were converted to Judaism and settled in the northern Negev. That is why Masada was built where it was. That was an Idumea. Idumea comes from Edom. Edom, which comes from Red, southern Jordan, where Esau settled. He was an ethnic Arab, an Idumean. For reasons of political convenience and advantage, his religion was Judaism. Not that he was a great Jew, it was just a political convenience, a political identity. However, they grew up with the emperors. <clears throat> Herod was considered to be a Roman by the Romans. The Romans took him as one of them. Now again, it's not our subject now. But it is in the book, Shadows of the Beast, and it is something that we will revisit in my next book if I ever get to write it, Lord willing. <laughs> Herod, this is not Herod the Great. I just described Herod the Great. He was a Jew, a Roman, and an Arab. This is his son, a Herodian. Pontius Pilate ruled Judea, a Roman. His headquarters was in Caesarea, not Rome. The Roman garrison was in Fortress Antonio on the north side of the Temple Mount. However, Galilee was still ruled by the Herodians. And again, we see the judgment of Herod, this of Herod, also in Caesarea, when he allowed himself to be worshipped as God. Because he controlled the food supply, they worshipped him. This is Acts chapter 12, and this is another type of the Antichrist. Again, I'd refer you to the book, Shadows of the Beast. Important reading. But let's look. So it begins with Herod. And Pontius Pilate. He was the surrogate ruler on behalf of the emperor. Okay. The emperor had been Tiberius, and Tiberius was followed by uh, Caligula, who was even more crazy than Tiberius. So it was Herod, Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles, Romans, not Jews, and the people of Israel. It does not say the Jews did it. It says Herod, Pilate, that's the legal responsibility. The Gentiles and the people of Israel. No place does the New Testament pin the whole rap on the Jews. That would be ridiculous. At this point, the only Christians who existed were Jews. The apostles were Jews. Jesus' mother Mary was Jewish. Jesus is a Jew. All Christians were Jews. And as we've said many times, in Romans 11, the prophecy, just as the first Christians will be Jews, the last Christians will be Jews. Revelation chapter 7. But let's look. So 
So it says, Herod, Pilate, that is the Roman government, the Gentiles, Romans, and Israel to do whatever they had and thy purpose predestined to occur. There is biblical predestination and there is non-biblical predestination. The non-biblical or the pseudo-biblical doctrine of predestination is hyper-Calvinism. God creates some for heaven and God creates some for hell. Moderate Calvinists don't go that far. Doctrinaire Calvinists do. Be that as it may, predestined. What do we read in Isaiah 53? He was pierced through for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. By his stripes we are healed. All of us, all we like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall upon him. Where in his second apologia does Peter, or perhaps more accurately, Peter and John, Place the culpability for the death of Jesus. Herod, Pontius Pilate, the non-Jews, the Romans, and the people of Israel. And that cannot possibly include all the people of Israel, given the fact that that the believers that existed at that time, and by this time we know from Acts chapter 2, there were thousands. We're all Jewish themselves. The idea <coughs> that the Jews killed Jesus is scripturally unfounded. It is an anti-Semitic lie. It is a lie of the devil. It is something Satan has always used to make Jews resistant to the gospel of their own Messiah. The Jews who had the gospel first and gave it to the nations. It is a complete lie. Now, anti-Semitism precedes Christianity. Pharaoh and Haman and Amalek were around long before Christianity. But what a disgrace that the body of Christ founded by the Jewish Messiah should be so corrupted and perverted into becoming an instrument of anti-Semitism in itself. And this extends to multi-denominations. Certainly the Roman Catholic Church. Then there is the anti-Semitism in large part, or at least a significant part, rooted in the preaching of John Chrysostom in the Eastern Orthodox Church. And then although Luther began right, and although he began with a benevolent and theologically correct understanding of God's love for the Jews when they didn't follow him and accept Christ as Messiah he became as notorious as any Christian anti-Semite had ever been in Mein Kampf, Hitler's book My Struggle, Mein Kampf Adolf Hitler quoted Luther verbatim at length. 
We, we the German nation, are to blame, for we do not murder them to prove we are Christians. That's one of the things he said. You have to murder Jews to prove you're a Christian, according to Luther. Now again, I do not deny for one second that Luther began right. But like King Joash or King Saul, he appears to have ended rather badly. And of course, his Jew hatred and anti-Semitism are not the only place Luther went off. Luther, if he was around today, we would be confronting him as a heretic because he denied the canonicity of certain books of the New Testament that he didn't understand or didn't agree with. He denied the epistle of James was, was canonical, wasn't the inspired word of God, and essentially said almost the same about the book of Revelation. He would interviews that were heretical. Man shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The whole counsel of God. The last thing that Jesus said is a curse to anybody who takes away from what's written in the book and Luther took away from it. His rather heavy-fisted position during the Peasants' Revolt was another issue. Now again, I don't question he began right, and at an early point, God used him. But there are other figures in the Bible of which we may say the same. And Luther, of course, not biblical figures, he's a historical one. But when you look at some of these kings who began right, and you wonder how they went off the way they did. King Saul, being the quintessential example, but not the only one. Joash being another. They began right. Let it be a warning to the rest of us. No, the anti-Semitism that already existed with a Haman or a Pharaoh or an Amalek was transmutated by the hand of Satan into the so-called church. Not all Christians subscribed to it. But all of mainstream Christendom, certainly Lutheran Protestantism, certainly Roman Catholicism, and certainly Eastern Orthodoxy did. So, Jesus in John 10 lays his life down. Nobody took it from him. They killed Jesus. Nobody could do anything to Jesus. If Jesus did not consent to it, and he consented to it because it was the prophesied will of his father. If he didn't consent to it, you and I would be going to hell. Don't believe William B. Young or Steve Chalk. It continues. There arose a division among the Jews because of these words. And they said what they said. I'm afraid of delving into chapter 11 because I'd, I'd get about four verses into it. We'd have to stop 